بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وتم تسليم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رمضان مبارك to all of you may Allah سبحانه وتعالى bless us immensely and this month, inshallah ta'ala, assist us in it. And bless us to fast in a way that is pleasing to him and to recite his book and stand in prayer in a way that is pleasing to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to that act in Ramadan, the way that the awliya and the salihin before us and during our time act. And so that we can that emerge from Ramadan, that with a renewed spiritual aspiration and a blessing that will carry us over into the remaining part of the year. Taken from the words of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَإِذَا سَلِمَ رَمَضَانَ سَلِمَتْ بَقِيَةَ السَّنَةَ If we give Ramadan its right and uphold its great right upon us and do what it is that we can, it will directly impact the remaining part of our year. And it will carry over. And there will be a blessing that then motivates us to dedicate ourselves to Him Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for the remaining part of the year. So this is an immense time for us to that spend in worship, and one of the greatest forms of worship is to spend time learning his deen. And there is something special about learning in Ramadan, and it relates to the heart's susceptibility to learn. And ultimately, that ilm nafa, beneficial knowledge, is a knowledge that speaks to our heart. It is a knowledge that transforms us from within. And even though we should do this all times throughout the year, especially in Ramadan, the circumstances are such that we are especially susceptible to benefiting. And we don't know, perhaps it will receive a nafha in one of the sweet breezes of Allah Ta'ala's mercy in this blessed month that changes us forever and is a means for us to that tread the spiritual path and to draw near to Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala and that is exactly what this book that we have before us is about, that is written by Imam Ghazali, Minhaj al-Abideen, translated as The Path of the Worshippers, Ila Jannati Rabb al to the Garden of the Lord of the Worlds. And we are going to pick up where we left off, but today we're going to spend the time kind of tracing our steps to figure out where it is that we are. Uh, I highly recommend that everybody follows along with the translation by Mukhtar Holland. And we have reached page 111, where he says, as for envy. We're not going to get to that today. We're going to uh, contextualize what came before so that we can understand where we are in the third hurdle. And why, of course, he's even using the word hurdle. And that why he's spoken on focusing on this particular disease of the heart that's going to be our goal today is to kind of trace our steps and to put into context where we're at on this particular section. And so Minhaj al Abidin is one of the very special books. And Imam Ghazali, he mentions in his introduction that he wanted to author a book that was accepted by consensus a book that no one could criticize. And he says in it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired him in this particular arrangement of chapters and of subsections. And the goal really ultimately is is to prepare people for the meeting with Allah, tabarak wa ta'ala. So this book has to be situated in the scholarship of Imam Ghazali in that post nidamiya phase where he's dedicated himself to ilm tariq al-akhirah, the science of the path to the hereafter. And he, this is one of the last books that he wrote. And even though some have that questioned its attribution to Imam Ghazali, that if we look closer, it, it does seem to be an authentic book of his. And one of the proofs of it is, is that if the some editions that it will say, 
this particular individual, in particular, Abd al-Malik ibn Abdullah, he says, Amla alayya. And then he's going to mention a number of wonderful ways of referring to Imam Ghazali. Essentially, he's referring to Imam Muhammad bin Muhammad al-Ghazali. Amla alayhi he dictated it to me. So this was the way that scholars used to write books. They didn't necessarily sit down and use computers the way that we do and cut and paste and take from here or there. Amla. Right? He's literally dictating the book. And you have someone, a scribe, writing it down. So just think about the oceans of knowledge that someone's going to have to be able to, be able to, that just from what's in their heart, dictate an entire book. And he's not the only one who used to do this. This was common practice amongst the ulama because their knowledge was with them wherever they traveled. Their knowledge was in their heart. And Allah subhanahu wa inspired them in this particular fashion and in these different ways with these various contributions for the enterprise of knowledge. And so this book, essentially, he wrote it for the one who wants to take a spiritual path and to draw near to him. And it's much more succinct, of course, than the Ahlul Madin. And it remains one of the great manuals, one of the great, great manuals of suluk, of spiritual wayfare and of tasawwuf. And if you look at kind of nowadays how we study these various books of the science, for our times, it's probably a that midway type book. It's not a beginner book. You know, a beginner book would be more something like Bidat al Hidayah, the beginning of a guidance of Imam al or sometimes you might even start before that with a book like Ayyuhal Walid, Dear Beloved Son. Um, and then you would might move after that to a book like Al Risalat al Mu'awana, Risalat al Mu'awana, the Book of Assistance. Um, and then maybe one other book, and then you'll come to Minhaj al Abidin of Imam uh, Al Ghazali. And so that this is uh, a moderate that size book that goes into quite a bit of detail, but it's of immense, immense, immense benefit. And from the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when I first reached that uh, tarim, this is a book that we started studying with our teachers there. And so that this is. Uh, a book that is packed with benefit. And even if you read it multiple times, you realize that I need to go back and read it again and read it again. So spending time in this blessed month of Ramadan, uh, basking in the shade of this blessed book is one of the great things that we can do. And so Imam Ghazali, essentially what he does is he lays out for us the path to Allah wa ta'ala. And he does tend to do this because he's a scholar that tends to that logically lay down the topics of knowledge that he will discuss. He speaks about the book in the introduction. And so the very best way to introduce it is to actually uh, look at the words of Imam Ghazali himself. And so I'm actually going to read from pages 9 all the way until that pages 16 or 17. Because he's laying down what the whole book is about. And then once we understand that, we're going to speak a little bit about the two chapters that we've already discussed, which is the hurdle of knowledge and the hurdle of repentance. And then we'll speak about what we've spoken about from the third hurdle, setting the tone for us to begin tomorrow, ta'ala, with where we left off. So for those that want to follow along, we'll be reading from the English translation on the top of page 9. And for brevity's sake, we'll just read the English. So he says, When the servant of the Lord is first awakened to worshipful service, that's how he translates ibadah, and devotes himself exclusively to traveling its path, he is motivated by a khatra samawiya, and that is a heavenly urge from Allah and a special enabling grace of divine origin, tawfiq khas ilahi. This is what is signified by his words, glory be to him, is he whose heart Allah has expanded to receive Islam, so that he is guided by a light from his Lord. So Allah speaks of this, the expanding of the heart in He's saying that this is how the spiritual path begins, with a khatra samawiyah, a heavenly notion, 
or a heavenly urge that Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala places in the heart. It's also referred to as a ba'ath. And this is from Tawfiq Khas Ilahi. Tawfiq is enabling grace, but it's a special type of enabling grace that is directly from Allah, i.e. of divine origin. And all you and I can do is to expose ourselves to receive this. But if someone receives this, it's one of the greatest blessings of all, after the blessing of faith, is to feel and to receive that ba'ath and thus be motivated to dedicate ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has also been indicated by the master of the sacred law, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for he said, when, the light, when light enters the heart, it expands and opens up. It expands and it's open. Anur ida dakhal al qalb in sharaha wa fasah. And this prompted someone to ask, Oh, Master of Allah, is there any obvious sign which can be recognized? And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the shunning of the abode of illusion, turning in repentance to the abode of eternity, and being prepared for death before its advent. In other words, is that this is a sign that someone's heart has been filled with light. They turn away from this illusory world. This is, world is an illusion, although it has very real repercussions. And repentance, the process of tawbah. And preparing for the meeting with Allah. Once we come to terms with our mortality, knowing that it is that we're going to die and to meet Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, what do we have to do? We need to prepare then. And so he says, Suppose this occurs to the heart of the servant, first of all. And he's saying that someone might speak to themselves and say, I find myself endowed with various kinds of benefits, such as life, power, intelligence, and so forth. There must be a giver of blessings who bestows these benefits and who requires me to respond by thanking and serving him. If I neglect to do so, he will remove his gracious favor from me. So we start to become aware once that we receive this very special that urge that Allah Ta'ala places in the heart. And the believer says that he has sent to me a messenger whom he has confirmed with miracles, disrupting the customary patterns of nature and exceeding the capability of the ordinary human being. He has informed me that I have a Lord who has various traits. And he goes on to mention some of those traits. One who commands and forbids, one who is capable of punishing if I disobey him and of rewarding if I obey him. Aware of my secrets of what pervades my thoughts. And then he says, It then occurs to his heart that this must be possible since there is no absurdity in that concept as initially conceived by the mind. He therefore fears for himself and feels alarmed. So sometimes when someone initially receives this ba'ith or this khatra samawiyah, it yuz'ijuhu. It creates this state internally where one feels motivated to get him or herself together. And sometimes it's accompanied by fear because someone looks at their own state and fears that if I meet my Lord now, am I ready? And so that fear is a motivating type of fear, not a type of fear that leaves you helpless. It motivates you to do something about your state. It is the experience of this alarm that alerts the servant obliges him to produce convincing evidence. It deprives him of any excuse and urges him to investigate and to seek proof. To want to do something. To want to get themselves together. To attain true knowledge. The servant is agitated and perturbed by this. So he examines the means of salvation, the acquisition of safety from what has impressed his heart or what he has heard with his ears. And Imam Ghazali is speaking from personal experience. He went through this. And for him, he received this, even though, if you look closely at his biography, he was exposed to the people of the path from early on. He was exposed to the people of the path early on. Uh, his brother, that Sheikh Ahmed bin Muhammad al-Ghazali, was one of the very pious the scholars. And he was someone who is that known to have that contributed greatly in Persian 
to poetry that speaks about passionate love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's beautiful stories of the interactions that his brother had with him. So he was around people of Allah from the early life. But this is precisely why in books like this and in the Ihya, he has a certain critique of formalistic type knowledge that neglects the spiritual path in the heart. And he received his powerful urge while he was teaching at one of the great institutions of higher learning in the Muslim world during the time. And he was the most well-known teacher that not only in his institution, but arguably in the Muslim world. And when he received his powerful urge, it motivated him to leave all of that behind, to embark upon a quest of becoming sincere before Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala. And so all of these books that we are reading, books of like the Ahir al and those that came after it, that are teaching us about the ilm tariq al-akhirah is all from the blessing of that powerful urge. And people thought that he gave up a lot, which he did outwardly, but what he received in return, what he experienced in return by way of experiential knowledge, and then what he was inspired with by way of knowledge that can be put into books such that it remains with us to, to this day, 900 plus years after, is immense and an incredible blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's speaking from personal experience. And you and I might be in a, in a number of varying circumstances when someone receives this. But this is what we should be asking Allah Ta'ala for in months like the blessed month of Ramadan and throughout that our days and nights is this khatra samawiyah, this ba'ith, this heavenly notion, this powerful urge to devote ourselves to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we hope that it comes because sometimes it, we know what it is that we need to do but we fail to do so. And then we receive an affliction. And that affliction puts everything into perspective for us. Or then we have to deal with a health condition to make sure that it is that we that stay on the right stay on the right track and adhere to this Sirat al Mustaqim. So he says he finds no alternative to using his mind to investigate the evidential signs and to draw conclusions about the creator from the creation. In other words, the starting point is to believe in Allah. This is, of course, directed towards people that already believe, of course. But this is where it begins, with the knowledge of Allah. And then this could happen to someone that was grown up, had grown up in Islam, that they have a conversion-like experience. In other words, they're already Muslim, so they're not converting. They were raised as a Muslim. But when they have a renewed sense of commitment to their faith, whereas they see so many people around them drifting, in remaining nominally Muslim, they have a renewed commitment to their faith. So that same experience could be someone that was had grown up in Islam, and just as someone who becomes Muslim might be gifted the deen of Islam, but not be given this particular powerful urge to tread the spiritual path. And then there's some people that become Muslim and are also gifted this. What we want ultimately is join between the blessing of Iman, which is a divine gift, and between the blessing of this powerful urge which motivates us to take a path to draw near to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the very first hurdle of all, and the word that Imam Ghazali uses is al-aqaba, al-aqaba. And an aqaba linguistically is a mountain pass. So it is a steep road that has an incline. And al-marqa al-sa'b fil jibad. So you can imagine yourself in the mountains. And there's a very difficult that road that is the only road that you have to pass to can pass through to get to that particular location. Uh, that is an Aqaba. And um, it came to be used for that any type of obstacle or any type of difficulty. So what he says here is ultimately there are a series of Aqabat, of obstacles or you could call them hurdles. He chooses here to refer to them as hurdles. And a hurdle is essentially an obstacle or difficulty. Is that between someone and attaining paradise. 
And in particular here, the paradisical state that Allah gives his people here in this world that comes upon them when they come to know him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says that between someone and between that goal, there are a series of obstacles. And these obstacles are not easy to traverse. They're doable. You can do it. But this is the greatest goal of all. And if you think about in a worldly sense, everything that people do to achieve some type of worldly goal, you can't attain anything in this world without striving for it. And of course, some people are privileged in some ways over the other that they receive certain things by doing less work. But in general, if you want to master something, if you want to be good in something, if you want to achieve something, whatever that thing might be, whether it's success in the business world or whether it be in the academic realm or whatever it might be, a particular goal that you have in relation to athletics even, you have to put in effort. But what he's saying here is, is that the greatest effort that we can ever spend on anything is the effort that the sadak, the one traversing the spiritual path, spends on drawing near to Allah and preparing themselves for the meeting with Allah and entering into paradise. And there's a way of doing this. He says, everything is that you do. If you want to be good in a particular career, you want to be good in a particular vocation or a particular sport or whatever, there's a way that you go about getting trained in order to you actually excel in that particular area. And it's no different in the spiritual path. And this is what he's doing for us. He is leaving behind this time-tested way. And just think about the thousands of awliya that came before us whose eyes fell upon the same words that we're reading. That we're going to be reading it primarily in translation, but for those that are following along in Arabic, it's the same words. Thousands of the greatest eyes that have existed here in this world that attain the highest degrees of closeness to Allah. That from various traditions, but in particular that of Sadat and Ali Badu, who used to love this book, but also in other that spiritual paths, this is a book that was read and reread and studied that meticulously in great detail and put into practice with the hopes of achieving the goal. So he says, the first hurdle of all is the hurdle of knowledge, ilm. This is the first hurdle, aqaba, to be confronted on the path of ibadah, of worship. And it is the hurdle of knowledge and insight so that progress can be made with sharp discernment in order to mount it. The seeker must inevitably engage in thorough investigation, in abundant contemplation, in study, and in consulting the scholars of the hereafter, or the guides of the spiritual path, the lanterns of the Islamic community, and the chiefs of the leaders. Useful advice must be sought from them as well as their righteous supplication for enablement and support, so the seeker may surmount the hurdle with the gracious help of Allah. And so this is, again, we're reading from his introduction. He lays out the whole path. And then in each chapter, of course, he's going to go into more detail. So then after this, he says, this understanding and certainty concerning the unseen will thereupon endow the seeker with commitment to service and with dedication to worship the beneficent master whom he has sought and found and with whom he has become familiar after he was ignorant of him. He still does not know how to worship him, however, nor what is required of him in serving him with both his outer and inner being. He says, therefore, the seeker must exert himself strenuously to learn what is required of him in the way of duties imposed by the sacred law, both outwardly and inwardly. And then this takes us to the second hurdle, which is the hurdle of repentance. Once he has perfected the knowledge and understanding of the religious duties, the seeker will be prompted to engage in worship and to preoccupy himself therewith. When he looks at himself, however, he will see that he is guilty of serious offenses and sins. For this is the state of the majority of human beings. So he will say, how shall I engage in worship when I am persistent in sinful disobedience, thoroughly stained thereby? It is therefore an obligation upon me to repent to him so that he may forgive all of my sins, deliver me from their captivity. Sins hold us captive. 
and make me pure and free from their pollution. I shall then become fit for service and performance of duty. At this point, therefore, the seeker is confronted with the hurdle of repentance, which he certainly needs to surmount in order to arrive at what is intended thereby. And so this is why they say of all of the maqamat al yaqeen the stations of certainty, the whole spiritual path begins with tawbah, repentance. This is the beginning. And the only reason Imam Ghazali mentioned knowledge before repentance is that you had to have knowledge of the importance of repentance or you're never going to repent. You have to have already believe in a Lord who will accept your repentance, otherwise you're never going to repent. So knowledge comes before repentance, but knowledge in of itself is not enough. That knowledge has to then lead to repentance. And then there's hurdles that come after that. Then once he has experienced genuine repentance and is no longer impeded that by this hurdle, the seeker will yearn for worship, eager to engage therein. When he examines his situation, however, he will see that he is completely surrounded by impediments, what he calls awa'iq. And so that awa'iq, aqa yu'uku, in the Arabic language, is to hinder, to prevent, or to impede. So these are impediments. They get in the way. Someone has knowledge, they've repented, they want to dedicate themselves to Allah and travel the path, but it's not that easy. This is the path to Allah. And you have to really give yourself fully for something dunyawi in order to really achieve that thing. What about Allah? What about Allah? Were we to only realize what comes that in the first stages of the path, let alone what Allah gives to those that, that are that well established in the path, let alone what Allah gives to those at the end of the path, were we to only know, we would give ourselves entirely to this whole matter. And as it has been said, is that whoever knows the adhamat and maqsad, whoever knows the greatness of what it is that they're trying to attain, is that, Hana Ali Mabadal. It's easy for him to sacrifice everything in its way. Are we to only realize, Are we only to realize, the sacrifice becomes easy. And again, it's hard though at first because we know, but we don't truly know. We haven't experienced it yet. We know because of what we hear from the elect of the righteous and what it is that they experience, what it is that they've been blessed with. But in order for us then to attain that, we have to follow in their footsteps. And it's a great station just to love them. But it is a higher thing to tread the path to be like them. And so this is why you have the true Sufi, which is a kerim of ta'zim. That should be a word, put all polemics aside. That is a noble word. And that is something that we should strive to be. Because the Sufi is the wasil. He is the one who has attained knowledge of Allah. They've moved up to at very least Ayn al Yaqeen, where they are in a state of the eye of certainty, where they are now that have a higher degree of certitude than anyone that's in the degree below them. And this is someone who has started to that experience that what other people don't experience through the knowledge that he has of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is a noble thing that we should all strive to be. And then you have the mutashabbah, the one who's trying to resemble that one who's arrived. And that one is someone who's traveling their path actively. And then you have the mutashabbah and mutashabbah. There's two conditions for him. The one that resembles the one who is resembling. And that is someone who believes in their path and loves them. So the bare minimum is that we believe in their path and we love them. It is for this reason, this science, I give to soul, the scholars have said, um, anyone who doesn't smell the scent of it, we fear for them that they'll die with a su'a of khatima, or being in a state of israr al al-kabar wa la ya'lamun, persistently committing major sins and they don't know. The science is important, and that we believe in its people. And this was the understanding of the people who came before us. And this has to be our understanding. We have to love them and to read their biographies and strive to the extent possible to resemble them. 
And this is precisely why we study books like this. So the next hurdle is the hurdle of the impediments. Then once he has experienced genuine repentance, no longer impeded by this hurdle, the seeker will yearn for worship. But then he sees himself completely surrounded by impediments, each one of them obstructing him with some kind of hindrance from the worship he intends to perform. On closer inspection, he will notice that they are four in number. This world, oh, the world itself, and his fellow creatures, other human beings. Number three, the devil, Shaitan. And number four, the nafs, the lower self. He will therefore need to surmount them by four means. Detachment from this world, which is four Relates to the first one. Isolation from his fellow creatures. Relates to the second one. Combat with the devil. Muharaba. Wage war against shaitan. The third. And then conquest of the lower self. You set out to conquer your nafs. And to be in control. So. This is the chapter that we stopped. On. And last year. We went into the detail about the dunya. The world and how it was in impediment. We went into the detail of the khalq, the fellow human beings, and how that human beings can be an impediment. There's a lot of detail to that. We're not going to go over all the details. You can read back through, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, and we also spoke about shaitan. And then we ended in the section on the nafs, where he would go into a discussion of taqwa, which is how that we got into that particular disease of heart envy, which is coming in the But it's good to remind ourselves of the remaining hurdles so we can know what it is that we're going to try to get to this year, Bidni Laitada in Ramadan. So he says here, as for the lower self, it is the most difficult of these impediments. The very worst of your enemies is your own self between your two sides. Since it is impossible for him to detach from it, it's you. All the other enemies are not you. Shaitan, although he flows in your blood, is not you. Right? Other human beings is not you. The dunya is not you. But your nafs is inside of you. Nor can he conquer it once and for all as he can subjugate the devil because it is the means of transport, his multiya, in the instrument, the ala. There's also no hope of its readiness to accept and perform worship intended by the servant, since it's naturally disposed to the opposite of goodness, in its unrefined state, that is, such as frivolity and indulgence therein. He therefore needs to bridle it with the reign of taqwa. And that's right at the essence of what we're learning for this year, bridling the nafs with the reign of taqwa. Look at that metaphor. You can imagine a wild horse in taming it and bridling that, training that horse until it becomes docile and obeys commands. And that bridling our nafs with taqwa, that's what we have to do. And so that we grasp the reins, metaphorically speaking, and we know when to restrain. We know when to let a little bit loose. You can't ride a horse and just keep, right? Because when you pull the reins, there's a bit that, you know, chokes the horse so that it stops. Right? You can't do that. If you're trying to get somewhere, you can't keep doing that to the horse. You can only do that at certain times. But it's a beautiful metaphor to really think deeply about that. Pre-modern travel and how people got from point A to point B and all of the various way stations and the concerns that you'd have to have for your own self and the weather conditions and that your riding beast, whether it's a camel or a donkey or a horse or whatever, you have to feed it, you have to water, you have to let it rest and so forth. But you also have to show that it's in control. You're in control. And I used to remember, la ilaha illallah, riding donkeys. And we were, on multiple occasions, we rode donkeys in Mauritania. And it was always so frustrating because even though they're not the most intelligent animals, they know who's riding them. And you'd get like these 10-year-old boys that have these donkeys in check. And I, part of it is I couldn't figure out that each animal had an, uh, a noise that was associated with your mouth that you'd make 
when you uh, want it to come or you want it to go. And um, each animal, you know, donkeys, cows, goats, they all had their own sounds. And so I couldn't even get the sound right. And you'd see like this 10-year-old, like in this donkey, just obeying every command. And here you are trying to get on top of them, and they know you're not a real rider. They know. By however they figure that out, with how it is that you're positioning yourself on their back to the sounds that you make to, you know. And then even if you hit the thing, poor thing, right? If they know you're not a good rider, they take advantage of you. And I remember, you know, riding with friends. First time I was there with our brother Mustafa Davis. And it would consistently take us like even though the path is wide, right into the trees where all the thorns were. And you'd see it coming, and you're trying to steer it, and it wouldn't listen. You'd be like, kuh, kuh, trying to hit it, and it's still like, uh-oh. And you have to brace yourself. And then the Mauritanian clothing is very baggy. So it's like literally it just take you right through the thorns, and you just try to like dodge it a little bit. And not just once or twice. You realize like they know who's riding it. And you just see like a little child. I was like 10 years old. It's like, kuh saying the sound's just right, and it's just like straight ahead, no problems whatsoever. Anyhow, the point here is, is that that's like your nafs, that we want to be masters of, that are how it is that we direct our nafs to good, and that take a path consistently over an extended period of time of drawing near to Allah, to Baraka wa ta'ala. So he says here, he therefore needs to bridle it with the rein of taqwa so that it will be at his disposal and not break away and be led by him and not rebel. He must employ it in good deeds and righteous works and keep it away from the dangers and causes of corruption. He will thus embark on surmounting this hurdle while appealing to Allah for help in that task. Then once he has succeeded in surmounting it, he will return to the intent of worship. And then... He will come to the next hurdle, which is what he terms the hurdle of awadid. Awadid. So that added awadid is that that uh, that it's a hal or a mana. It's an it's an obstruction, something that gets in the way of something. And so he says hindrances will still obstruct him, obstruct him, however, distracting him from the performance of his intended worship in preventing him from devoting himself properly to that purpose. So even if he overcomes those enemies and those things that are trying to that impede his worship and the ones that were mentioned, so the awaiq, the world, fellow creatures, the devil, his own self, still there's going to be things that he has to overcome, even if he masters that. And he says that the upon investigation, he will discover that these are four in number. There's four hindrances, awaiq. The first is rizq, sustenance. And the sustenance demanded by the lower self, which will say, I cannot do without sustenance in provision. I have now become detached from this world as well as being isolated from fellow creatures. So what will be the source of my provision and my sustenance? And there's, of course, nuance there in our context. It doesn't mean that we necessarily have to completely not be around people. So this is the first. And then the second is, is that the risk inherent in everything he fears or hopes for, desires or detests. He does not know whether his course is right or wrong in this respect because the consequences of all matters are obscure. His heart is concerned about them, for he might lapse into some depravity or perilous situation. So the akhtar. So you have risk, which is your sustenance, and that the akhtar, that all of the dangers that someone or risks that someone might face. And then you have shada'id and masa'ib. The hardships, and this is the third category, and misfortunes inflicted upon him from every side, especially now that he has committed himself to contradicting his fellow creatures, waging war on the devil and opposing the lower self. It's expected that you're going to go through tribulation. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with sustenance? How do you deal with various dangers? How do you deal with hardships and misfortunes? And then, and wa al qada, the vicissitudes of faith, causing him to experience sweetness and bitterness on various occasions. And so he says he needs to surmount these four by the following four absolute trust in Allah in relation to sustenance, 
tafweed, deference to Allah, assigning your fear over to Him in relation to the dangers. Patience, sabr, in enduring the affliction of hardships, in contentment, rida, in response to the advent of fate. So again, he's going to get into all this in detail. He's just saying that on the spiritual path, this is what's going to happen. Just when you think you got yourself in control, oh, there's the sustenance issue. Then this is going to happen. Da, 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 da. And the spiritual path is very detailed. This is why we need this. Because if you live an average life, at various times in your life, you will go through exactly what Imam Ghazali is saying. But he's giving us, by way of knowledge, what is that we need to go through that and to succeed in it. And then you come to the hurdle of the incentives, the bawa'ith. So that ba'atha is to arouse or to awaken, to call forth. A ba'ath is an inducement, a motive, uh, that it's an incentive. So the hurdle of the incentives. The seeker has thus set about surmounting the hurdle of the four hindrances with the permission of Allah and the benefit of his assistance. As soon as he has succeeded in surmounting it in return to the intent of worship, he will notice that his lower self is weak and lazy. It displays no vim and energy and no enthusiasm for goodness as, is rightly as it rightly and properly should. Its inclination is always to nothing but heedlessness, relaxation, comfort, or idle in idleness, or indeed to wickedness, mischief, tribulation, ignorance, even if you overcome everything that was mentioned. This is the nature of the soul. At this point, he needs someone who will drive and steer it towards goodness and obedience and who will stimulate it accordingly. The answer is hope and fear. This is where he's going to go into a detailed discussion of hope and in fear. Hope means expectation of the splendid reward of Allah and the excellent kinds of grace he has promised. The recollection thereof is that like a pilot, a driver that will steer the lower self and spirit towards obedience, propelling it in that direction, arousing its enthusiasm. Fear means dread of the painful torment of Allah and the agony of all types of punishments and disgrace that he has threatened. Bahakada. And therefore, it will, that when that we acquire fear, it will restrain the lower self from sinful disobedience. The seeker was thus confronted by the hurdle of the incentives, the bo'av, so he needed to surmount it by the two means that have just been mentioned. He tackled it with the benefit of Allah's enabling grace, so he succeeded in surmounting it. Then, as soon as he had done so, he returned his attention to the performance of worship. He saw no obstacle and no distraction, and he found an incentive and a stimulus. So he applied himself eagerly to worship, performing and embracing it with total enthusiasm and keenness, and made it his regular practice. Then, when he reviewed his situation, he noticed that his, this splendid worship in which all of that was possible could be affected by two terrible plagues, namely, Ria, hypocritical display, showing off, in vain conceit, Ujib. He would at one time perform his act of obedience to impress other people and thereby spoil it. On another occasion, he would refrain from that and blame his lower self, thereby indulging in self-conceit. So he would render the worship null and void, ruining and spoiling it. The seeker was thus confronted by the hurdle of the impairments, the qawadih. So qadaha, yaqadahu is to, to bore, to pierce something. Uh, just as it means to that to slander or to defame something. So here the idea of an impairment. So the seeker was thus confronted by the hurdle of the impairments, and he needed to surmount it by refraining from taunting reference to his generosity and such like, so whatever good he had done would be preserved to his credit. He tackled this hurdle with Allah's permission, with diligence, caution, and awareness of the excellent protection of the all-compelling one and his support. Then... Once he had completed all of this, it seemed that worship was possible for him in its right and proper form, safe from every atha, from every detriment. When he looked closely, however, he saw that he was immersed in the oceans of Allah's blessings and his benefits because of the abundance of grace bestowed upon by Allah in the way of enabling support, safekeeping, all kinds of assistance, protection, and munificence. 
He was afraid that he might be guilty of neglecting thankfulness and thereby lapse into ingratitude, so that he would sink from that lofty degree, the degree of the servants who are sincerely devoted to Allah. He would lose those noble blessings consisting of the various favors of Allah and his excellent regard for him. He was thus confronted at this point by the hurdle of praise and thankfulness. Hemmed in shukr. So that's the last of the seven. He therefore tackled this hurdle and surmounted it with the means at his disposal, with abundance of praise and thankfulness for his many blessings. Then once he had succeeded in surmounting this hurdle and had alighted beyond it, he found himself at his destination. His aspired goal was now in front of him. So he had only a little distance to travel until he reached the plain of gracious favor, the desert of ardent longing, and the open space of loving affection. He would then alight in the meadows of good pleasure, in the gardens of intimate friendship, and the carpet on the carpet of happiness. At the stage of close proximity, the session of confidential conversation, and the bestowal of robes of honor and tokens of prestige. Once the seeker has reached his destination, he will continue to enjoy these spiritual states, savoring their fragrance throughout the days of his survival and the rest of his life, with a bodily form in this world and a heart in the hereafter. With a bodily form in this world and a heart in the hereafter, he will wait for the day. Uh, he will date. He will wait for the courier day by day until he loses all interest in his fellow creatures, regards this world as unclean, yearns for death and consummates the ardent longing for the heavenly host and men at Ala. He is now in the presence of the messengers of the Lord of all the worlds. They will bring him refreshment and fragrant must, good tidings and good pleasure from the presence of a Lord who is well pleased, not angry. They will transport him, transport him to well-being, the perfection of joy and intimate friendship from this fleeting and deceptive world to the presence divine in the abode of the gardens of paradise. He will then see that his poor, weak self has a permanent blessing and a great and mighty dominion. At this point, he will receive from his master the all-compassionate, the gracious, the noble, and generous, magnificent in his remembrance, such kindness and affection, such welcoming and hospitality, such benefaction and respect, that it cannot be encompassed by the description of the describers nor by the characterization of the characterizers. His blessing will increase each day for all eternity. Oh, what a splendid happiness. Oh, what a lofty state. Oh, what a fortunate servant. What an enviable man. And what a praiseworthy condition. Joy is for him and bliss the journey's end. And then he goes into dua. We beseech Allah, the kind, the compassionate. Glory be to him and exalt is he to grant us and you this splendid bounty and momentous favor. This is not difficult for Allah. Even though it sounds difficult, do this. This is not difficult for Allah. We beseech him not to include us among those who have no experience of this matter, but only a description, oral information, formal knowledge, and unfulfilled desire. We beseech him not to use the knowledge we have acquired as evidence against us on the day of resurrection. We beseech him to enable us to act appropriately in all respects and to perform our duty to his liking and approval. He is the most merciful of the merciful, the most generous of the most generous. May Allah bless our chieftain, Sayyidina Muhammad, his family, and his companions, and may he grant them peace, honor, and nobility. This is the tartib, the sequential arrangement suggested to me by my patron, Mobla, and the path of worshipful service. You should now understand, therefore, through Allah's enabling grace, that the hurdles, the akabat, add up to a total of seven. The hurdle of knowledge, the hurdle of repentance, the hurdle of the impediments, the hurdle of the hindrances, the hurdle of the incentives, the hurdle of the impairments, the hurdle of praise and thankfulness. These constitute the complete subject matter of the path of the worshipful servants to the garden of the Lord of all the worlds. We shall now follow this list of hurdles with concise definitions, including all the important points. We shall devote a separate chapter to each hurdle, if Allah so wills. Allah is the guardian of enabling grace and guidance, and there is no might nor any power except with Allah, the All-High, the Almighty. If that's it. If you just read that, it's as if that you read the entire book. And so what we did last year is that we looked at the first hurdle of knowledge and uh, in it that he speaks about the merit of knowledge. And then he says that we have to that make knowledge a priority. 
Is it so that everything that we do is correct and upon a strong foundation? And in particular, our worship is that it be sound. And then that he goes into details of the obligatory knowledge that you and I all need to know in relation to belief, in relation to practice, the ahkam of the sharia, the sacred laws of the rulings of the sacred law, in relation to the science of the heart. And then he says also is that the other reason we have to give preference to knowledge is that this is how we attain this great state of khasha, this reverential awe and fear that we have of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. And then in chapter 2, that on the Aqaba to Toba, the hurdle of repentance, is that he says is that the first reason that we have to take repentance seriously is that if we do not repent from past sins that we've done, it will shackle us and prevent us from traversing the spiritual path. Is that sins shackle us and that they prevent us from receiving divine blessings. Just as we learned there are Moana, there are various things that get in the way of us receiving Allah's mercy in special times like the month of Ramadan. And that in general, this is how sins are to the spiritual path. Is that it's like putting a hole in a bucket that you're trying to gather water in. Is that you put water in and it goes right out. And then also too, is that in order for our acts to be accepted, this is something that we need, is that to be people of Toba. And then he'll pose a question where he'll talk about a Toba Nasur. And what is a sincere Toba? A Toba that someone makes that they never ever return to it ever again. And he proceeds to then talk about in great detail the type of repentance that he accept, that he expects us to do. And um, that's highly recommended that we uh, look into that and review that. And I remember when we read this with our teacher, is that after reading that section, he asked us, who did this? And he wanted everyone to raise their hands. Who did this? And then the next session, he asked the same question. And it was expected that anyone who uh, didn't do it when he asked the first time would have done it. And he asked for hands. Who did this? And this starts from page 41 in the book, where he says, to put the whole matter in a nutshell, you must begin by absolving your heart of all sins. And he walks you through the steps. And he eventually will say, you must then lay dust on your head and rub it on your face which is the most dignified member of your body, with streaming tears, a sad heart, and a loud lament. You must recall your sins one by one, as far as you are able, blaming and scolding your disobedient self for them, and saying, Are you not ashamed? O oh, lower self, nafs, is it not time for you to repent? And that's a very detailed description all the way until that page 43. And so that's the Aqaba to Tawbah. So you have the hurdle of knowledge and the hurdle of repentance. And then you have the Aqaba to Awa'iq. So again, Awa'iq are impediments. And uh, he mentions in this chapter four, so you have the dunya. And he says here is that we have to that be weary of the impediment of this world. And he says for two reasons. So that your worship will be correct in frequent your interest in this world keeps you preoccupied. The first reason. The second reason is that it increases the value of your work and magnifies its worth and its honor. So one of the great ways to get a multiplied reward for any act of obedience that we do is to drain our heart of the love of this world. Is that the less love of the world that we have in our heart, the more presence of heart that we have with Allah, the higher the quality of that particular act of worship. So the first impediment is the dunya and the world. The second one is the khalq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Because again, Allah's creation preoccupies us from worshiping Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even if they don't preoccupy us, is that they sometimes will spoil that good that we've received as a result of some type of worship or something that is that we've done. And he goes into a lot of detail here, and there's a lot of nuance to this discussion, which we're not going to go in now. 
Uh, but it, it, it really is a good idea for those that it were even in the classes last year to review. You know, as we kind of prepare and read ahead, we should also review what preceded so we can figure out exactly where it is that we are. And then the third impediment is shaitan. And he goes into detail there how we need to be aware that he is an adubun muldillun mubin. That an enemy who is a parent and is that trying to lead us astray. We have to recognize is that shaitan is an enemy. And he's just he is aware of our vulnerabilities because of the sellout the nafs that's inside, giving him the inner secrets, that sharing that your vulnerability and how it is that he should whisper or how it is that he should come at you. And that he is that completely freed up to lead us astray. So we drop our guard and think that everything's fine. No, you are in the ring at all times with shaitan. Just as a boxer, what do they always tell you? That guard yourself at all times. You drop your guard, right? You're going to get hit and it might knock you down. We hope that it doesn't knock us out, but we have to be ready. So at least if we have our guard down, that we can kind of that slip the punch or whatever. Anyhow, shaitan is an enemy that's trying to get us at all times. And so we learned about how it is that we can overcome this particular impediment. And then the fourth is the nafs. And ultimately, that the cure to the nafs is going against it and putting it in check, bridling it with taqwa. And uh, he discussed a number of different things uh, in this chapter uh, on the nafs. And he's, eventually what he gets into is his discussion of taqwa, where he starts to go into a lot of detail on how it is that you and I bridle that are nafs with taqwa and what it is that that means. And so he, he got into a definition of taqwa and um, that he that talked about the various fruits of taqwa and how it is that you and I can acquire taqwa. And what he starts to do then is to go that and talk about the details of how taqwa relates to the eye, the physical eye. And then he'll go and talk about how taqwa relates to the ear, and then how taqwa relates to the lisan, the tongue. So all of that we covered last year. And then he'll start to talk about how taqwa relates to the qalb, the heart. And that's where we left off, inshallah ta'ala, where we will pick up tomorrow and review what it, all, or what it is that we've covered from the heart and get to the specific place that we left off when it comes to the terrible disease of envy, may Allah ta'ala purify our hearts of it. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, we'll continue our study of the blessed book, Minhaj al-Abideen. Uh, we're still in the third hurdle, the hurdle of impediments, under the sub, the, the sub point of the discussion of the nafs. And how it is that we bridle the nafs with taqwa. How it is that we control our tongue. How it is that we control that our eyes. And how it is that we control our ears. And all of our other limbs. But then our heart. And so this is where we left off. And where we pick up. May Allah ta'ala give us tawfiq and bless us in this affair. And to give us great openings and a deep understanding in this science. And in this blessed work. And bless us to be able to put it into practice in a way that is pleasing to him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bless us in these days of Ramadan. Ya Arhamar Rahmin. Bless us be from the elect of those who receive his forgiveness. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah ta'ala forgive us of all of our slip-ups and all of our sins. And everything that we've done between us and between other people. Ya Allah. Everything we've done privately and publicly. Major sins and minor sins. Ya Arhamar Rahmin. May we return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all of our different states. Relying solely upon him, assigning all our affairs over to him. Tabarak wa ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Misir al-Fatiha wa ila hadrat al-Nabiyyin.